Prime Minister, Minister, Ambassadors and High Commissioners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Bulla. Bulla and welcome to the Pacific Lecture by the Prime Minister of Fiji, the Honourable Sitavani Rambuka at this beautiful venue. I'm Michael Fullilove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. Let me acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're gathered today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Thank you to the Foreign Minister for being here. Let me also acknowledge the Shadow Foreign Minister, Senator Birmingham, the Shadow Pacific Minister, Michael McCormack, the Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs, Tim Watts, the Chief of Army, Lieutenant General Simon Stewart, as well as many ambassadors and high commissioners in this room, including Australia's High Commissioner to Fiji and the High Commissioners of Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Solomon Islands and Nauru to, to Australia, as well as Japan's Ambassador to Australia and the US Ambassador to Australia. That is a lot of excellencies. So welcome excellencies <laughs> and apologies if I left out any excellencies. This event is a collaboration between the Lowy Institute and the Foundation for Development Cooperation. Let me warmly recognise Anne-Marie O'Keefe, the Chair of the foundation, as well as Stephen Taylor, its executive director. I'd also like to mention uh, a distinguished Lowy Institute board member, Penny Wensley. Welcome, Penny. Finally, a lot of acknowledgements. I apologise for that. I'd like to acknowledge the strong support and participation of the Fijian and Pacific communities here today, Nisambula Vanaka. And before I go any further, I, I want to invite someone else, Dr. Lesi, Dr. Lesi Korovavala, the Permanent Secretary of Fiji's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to open this event with a short prayer. Dr. Lesi. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you who created us in your image, and he gave us your identity. Guide us in your mercy, and we commit our leaders, your servants, in this event. Let your light shine upon them and upon us, that your will may be done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Lessey. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for us to host Prime Minister Rambuka here today on the first visit to Australia by Fiji and PM in four years. PM, Australia and Fiji are old friends and good friends. We're both proud sporting nations and I want to congratulate you on the tremendous success at the Rugby World Cup. I thought I would get that in first before you made a joke at my expense. I must say I was sorry PM to see Fiji lose to the old enemy. Um, the other day in a tightly fought contest, but the rugby players have been wonderful ambassadors for your country. Uh, it does seem to me, PM, that whenever either Fiji or Australia is in trouble, the other steps in to help. We were the beneficiaries of that assistance in 2020 when Fijian engineers helped with our bushfire crisis. Last year, 45 brave Fijians helped to rescue those trapped in Lismore's floods. And then just last week, a Fiji Airways flight helped to bring 13 Australians alongside nearly 200 other pilgrims from Fiji and other countries home from Israel in the aftermath of Hamas's brutal and indiscriminate act of terror. So thank you for that assistance, PM. Ladies and gentlemen, the Institute provides one of the world's most prominent platforms for global leaders. In the past year, we've hosted President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand, Prime Minister Sana Marin of Finland, and Prime Minister Kaya Kallas of Estonia. On the 19th of December, we will host Prime Minister Anthony Albanese at the Sydney Town Hall, where he will deliver the 20th anniversary Lowy Lecture. Prime Minister Rambuka is the second Pacific leader we have hosted this year. In March, on this stage, with Anne-Marie and FDC, the Lowy Institute hosted Samoa's Prime Minister, Fiame Naomi Mata'afa. So, to introduce Prime Minister Rambuka, it's my pleasure now to call on Australia's Foreign Minister, Senator Penny Wong. Senator Wong has represented South Australia in the Senate for 21 years. She has served as Minister for Climate Change, Minister for Finance, as well as Leader of the Government in the Senate. 
Since the election of the Albanese government last year, she served as foreign minister. I think we can already say that she is emerging as one of Australia's most formidable foreign ministers. She's carried out her responsibilities with energy and dispatch. With the PM, she flew to a meeting of the Quad in Tokyo just hours after being sworn in. Since then, she's visited every Pacific Island country and all ASEAN countries except Myanmar. Penny is everywhere. Anywhere I go in the world, from Southeast Asia to the US, I, if I bump into official, an official, usually the first thing they say is, I've just been with Penny. Um, and that's a, that's a great thing for an Australian uh, foreign policy think tanker to hear. So congratulations, Minister, and I, I want to take this opportunity in particular to congratulate you and Ambassador Graham Fletcher and all your colleagues in the department for securing the release of Chung Lei last week at a very dark moment in international affairs. It was a relief to get some good news. So to continue with the good news and to introduce the Prime Minister of Fiji, let me call on the Foreign Minister, Senator Penny Wong. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you and the Lowy Institute, he's a bit taller, um, <clears throat> for your contribution uh, to the discussion in this country about foreign policy and international relations. It's an important discussion. Don't always agree with everything that um, might be written, but I welcome an informed debate in this country. Uh, it's a very important time. Uh, can I first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples? I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that acknowledgement of respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person who has joined us this evening. Uh, I also want to, there were many acknowledgements. I have parliamentary colleagues here, my assistant minister Watts, uh, my opposition counterpart uh, Simon Birmingham, uh, Nick Micmac, you should support the Pacific Exchange Engagement Visa. Just ask, just ask Prime Minister Ambuka. I didn't, that was not caucus. Just so, that, was, that was genuine. Um, uh, to all the members of the Diplomatic Corps and to our um, uh, ambassadors and high commissioners, Welcome and thank you for the work you do. Uh, particularly on acknowledgement to Ewan MacDonald who has had such a influence on our relationship with the Pacific over many years, served uh, governments of both political persuasions uh, uh, extraordinarily well. So thank you, Ewan. Hope he's enjoying Fiji. Is he enjoying Fiji, Prime Minister? <laughs> I can't pay my respects to First Nations people without acknowledging this is such a difficult time for so many. Now is a time for healing. Now is a time for our country to come together and to chart a new course forward on reconciliation and closing the gap. And we must all be guided by and listen to First Nations communities and what those next steps look like. Because the referendum result does not diminish the experiences nor the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And because this is not the end of the, world, uh, end of the road, we are home to the oldest continuing culture on earth. And the connections between the first peoples of this land and the peoples of the Blue Pacific stretch back through time. And just as these connections form a part of our core history, they must also form our shared future as a peaceful, stable and prosperous Pacific. And that's something I know my counterparts in the region understand and value deeply. And that, of course, includes tonight's distinguished great guest, a great friend of Australia, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji, Sitaveni Rambuka. So, PM, I first acknowledge, I'll extend my sympathies for the quarterfinal. <laughs> Pretty extraordinary achievement to reach it. And as you know, I've had to engage about uh, the World Cup with great humility as you beat us for the first time in 69 years, as you told, us on, as you told me on numerous occasions when we last met. <laughs> as you were a flying Fijian yourself, Prime Minister, I suppose you've been avenged. 
as well as being a star on the rugby pitch. This I didn't know about you. The Prime Minister competed in the 1974 Commonwealth Games in the decathlon, where he was also Fiji's flag bearer. Well, you're Fiji's flag bearer once more. I also begin with my thanks, uh, which, uh, and the thanks of all Australians. We appreciated very much, as I told you today, your assistance in flying 13 Australians from Israel earlier this week. And I'm very pleased that we were all, uh, also able to subsequently assist 30 Fijians and about 135 citizens of Pacific Island nations overall to leave Israel. Uh, and this demonstrates how we count on one another, the vale in practice. Now, PM, you're no stranger to the Middle East. I know you served on a UN peacekeeping mission in Lebanon and as commander in Sinai. And I'm conscious, as we have discussed, that Fiji has hundreds of peacekeepers in the region right now. Uh, and I again say publicly that we honour Fiji's proud tradition in peacekeeping. In my national statement to the UN General Assembly last month, I said that Australia welcomes your proposal to establish a new Pacific peacekeeping network to strengthen our region's capacity and cooperation. It is just one way in which Fiji is a force for peace in the world. And you yourself, Prime Minister, are a highly respected leader who has demonstrated your sincere commitment to bringing people together and our region together. Since coming into office, uh, just less than a year ago, you've shown your determination to build an economically stable and secure future for the Fijian people. And you've wasted no time in bolstering Fiji's democratic institutions, in enhancing media freedoms and government accountability and delivering your first budget. And Prime Minister, you've also demonstrated your commitment to building a stronger and more united Pacific. And central to this is the way you have demonstrated in, act, in action your respect for the institutions that protect our region. Your early diplomatic outreach to Kiribati was critical in bringing the Forum family back together. Australia believes in Pacific sovereignty, with the PIF, the Forum, leading the region in the Pacific way guided by the 2050 strategy. Now you are advancing your vision for a zone of peace to create a region characterised by peace and prosperity not conflict and division. It's a, vision, it's a vision we share. Fiji and Australia understand that our security is enhanced when we work together, when we respond to Pacific priorities and when we respect Pacific institutions. We are counting on each other to play our part, each play our part in a shared Pacific that is peaceful, state, safe, stable and prosperous. Just as we are counting on each other, to face the threats to our region together, not the least of which, of course, is climate change. It is a true honour for our country to welcome a member of the Pacific family of such leadership and determination. So Prime Minister Rambuka, can I thank you publicly for your ongoing commitment to building a peaceful and prosperous Pacific, for your regional leadership and for your wisdom. I know everyone here is very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I believe, would you please welcome the Prime Minister. G'day. Ms. Ambula, I thank uh, Senator Wong for her very kind words of uh, introduction. And I thank you all for allowing me to speak to you today. I am more than pleased to be here uh, to address the the world-renowned Lowy Institute, and uh, I'm very happy to be making this uh, speech on my first visit to Australia since we were sworn into office in December of last year. 
Prior to that, I had uh, made a, uh, a state visit to Australia, which was uh, cut short when my president took ill. And uh, Prime Minister Keating lent me his aircraft to fly me back quickly to Fiji to farewell my uh, then president, sadly, for the last time. And he went to America and I had the uh, Walter Reed Military Hospital. Uh, so I officiated at the uh, state funeral ceremonies held in his uh, honor. I had prepared a speech for today and then uh, somebody did something in the Middle East. So I've had to uh, change that as the events in Israel and across uh, Gaza border have, uh, have had a bearing on our thinking and our work since they happened. But those events have uh, provided a vindication for what I'm advocating in my main message. Uh, you uh, have been told I'm a, a former peacekeeper. I commanded Fiji's uh, battalions on the uh, north of Israel in Lebanon with Unifil and also in Sinai as part of the Camp David Accord and uh, uh, the uh, multinational force and observers, peacekeeping forces in the Sinai. But let me start with uh, something that happened last week. And uh, Senator Wong has uh, very kindly referred to that. We were caught in a, uh, in a deadly drama. Prior to that, a plane load, chartered plane load of uh, pilgrims from Fiji had gone to be in Israel. My wife and a niece were on the passenger list. But while I was uh, in uh, New York for the UN General Assembly, I remembered that the weekend would coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. So I called home and asked my wife to not get on the flight and stay. Because if anything had happened to her while to the, uh, to the flight while she was there, I would not be able to deal with the situation objectively. I'll probably be hampered or driven by emotions because my own family is involved. So I told her, please, uh, let's see if we can go, you can go next year. So she got off uh, the list. I didn't pay the fare, so for me it was okay. <laughs> And uh, we had to go very quickly. I had to uh, cast off my civilian prime minister uniform and get into the other uniform and ask some people, and told people. Uh, Dr. Lessi had just uh, said the prayer. He, I told him, uh, Doc, we have to get our people back. Very simple. And he said, yes, sir. So he got on with uh, some very efficient senior civil servants in Fiji, and we connected with our own uh, High Commissioner here in Canberra, His Excellency Ajay Amrit, who after what, three days, had managed to connect with uh, uh, diplomats here in Canberra, and we started, they started talking. The, the insurers of our national air carriers came on to say, if the Israelis say it's safe, you can go. They prepositioned the aircraft in Hong Kong with a full fuel load. And as soon as uh, 
the Iron Dome was uh, activated. The Israelis said uh, the eel cleared to fly, but you can only be on the ground for, for two hours. That was good enough for the Fiji Airways management and uh, executives, and the pilots were already in Hong Kong, so they took off. And on the uh, morning of the 12th of this month, that was last week, last Thursday, we welcomed them back to Fiji. And the flight included some Australians. And we were very happy that uh, that was carried out safely. But after they got back, we were told that there was still a group of about 30, 40 uh, Fijians left behind. And I was uh, listening to see if any other airline would be going in for a rescue mission. We were told that the Australians were putting on special flights, so we asked if they could be included on the passenger list. And I'd like to thank Australia, New Airlines, for allowing those left behind unintentionally, uh, un unbeknown to us, they were there, they were allowed to come back with your rescue flights. For us, it was a, a hot extraction operation. Those of uh, us who have uh, been in uniform would understand that situation. An evacuation from a hostile zone or withdrawal in the face of hostile enemy fire. We set up a, an operation center in Suba manned by the senior civil servants and communication network with the Fiji diplomat, diplomats in Canberra. And I thank you for, for uh, accepting uh, High Commissioner Ajay. We connected with uh, our permanent rep in New York, in the UN, another retired colonel. When I, when I took our office, a lot of people raised their concerns that I might once again try to militarize the civil service. But they came in for the interview through the Public Service Commission. They were selected, and they were in the right place, the right time for us to very efficiently carry, it out, carry out that operation. They assisted me in drawing up my experience of achieving the objectives in uh, conditions of peril, we consulted on specifics with representatives from those uh, friendly countries, including Israel, while maintaining close liaison with the operation center at home in Suba, the national air carriers. They began to put together that plan, uh, and we were able, after the Israelis assured us that uh, the dome had been created, Iron Dome, and uh, Ben Gurion Airport would be relatively safe for flights to come in as long as they got in by day, came out by day, not spend more than two hours on the ground. They also had, and we also had the information that on October the 9th, the uh, attack on, uh, on the airport would begin or would intensify. We were fortunate to be able to get that uh, Fiji Airways Airbus 330 uh, to go there. And before they did that, they were rehearsing, uh, speeded up check-in systems, and they were able to land, process the passengers, and take off in the time window available for us. That was after a, another risk assessment was carried out by Fiji Airways, and off they went. And as I said, we received them back home on the morning of October the 12th, as the nation was celebrating the arrival, uh, the anniversary of the arrival of the first missionaries in 1835, the 12th of October, 1835. And on Sunday, I went to Paramata Church, uh, which was the main launching church for the missionary work in Fiji. 
I praise the pilot and the cabin crew for their valor, world-class expertise, and sense of duty, and describe the repatriation as historic, daring, and very well planned. And as I said, uh, among the rescued were pilgrims from New Zealand, Samoa, Canada, America, the Philippines, and Australia. We fulfilled our role as a world citizen. And uh, at the welcome, I made it clear that Fiji stands with Israel and condemned the uh, attacks by Hamas and the killing of innocent lives. I later called for immediate release of those that were abducted and expressed concern about indiscriminate firing of thousands of missiles and rockets towards Israeli communities. While they were en route back home, the pilgrims uh, heard that their host in one of the kibbutz had died in the fighting and he died defending a small kibbutz uh, uh, community. I have uh, also stressed that all parties to the Middle East conflict should now try and accept diplomacy and dialogue to seek a peaceful resolution. There is no resolution through violence. I echo the words of Pope Francis, who said, and I quote, the Middle East does not need war, but peace, a peace built on dialogue and the courage of fraternity, end of quote. And that leads me to the ideals and principles behind the uh, proposal for our part of the Pacific. It envisages a new international role for us as a zone of peace. Over the past year, I've been thinking more and more about peace, not only as a foundation for my country, but also as a course, embracing wider horizons in the Pacific and beyond. I sense uh, some questions already arising out of the, of, uh, the, uh, the group, the institute, members who are here. Why would a coup maker, like the one we are listening to now, who gained notoriety 30 years, 36 years ago, as a Rambo figure, why should he be engaging in such thoughts? I came back from being a peacekeeper and very seriously read my Bible again. And then I realized that peacekeeping was not mentioned in the Bible. Jesus said, peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. So I started thinking about making peace rather than just keeping peace. But I also, some of you know, I have repented, I'm reborn. My past cannot be removed, but I can compensate to some extent for what I had done. Many years ago, I became a convinced Democrat. I saw democracy with all its faults and awkwardness, particularly with uh, communities based on communalism and tribalism in the Pacific, I, we felt, or I felt that it was the best way of governance with all its faults. It is of the people and for the people. Some at home think I, I think like that because I'm not a chief. Otherwise I would have gone for traditional aristocracy as the way to go. Now this democratic politician will do whatever he can to be an apostle for peace. And come with me now to the aquatic empire of the Pacific Ocean. It is by far the largest body of water on the planet, encompassing 181 million square kilometers, or roughly a fifth of the Earth's surface. Our small island states, along with Papua New Guinea, occupy a huge expanse of the Pacific, and that is known as Oceania. 
Fiji and our neighbors carry the cultural and historical inheritance of navigators of PLS skill. With their kin and clan members, they traversed vast distances. After abandoning their original homes, whether it be Asia or in Africa, our forebearers were seeking new lives, new horizons in what we now know as the Pacific Ocean. We can only speculate on why they compelled, they were compelled, they felt compelled to make the voyage into the unknown. They journeyed in great outrigger canoes, transporting up to 100 crew and passengers across miles and miles of unknown waters. We believe that the uh, sailors involved and those in charge of those double-hulled craft crafted their way by studying the winds, the setting sun, the stars, the movement of currents and waves, marine creatures, the flight of birds, and floating flora. It was one of the most amazing migrations in history, a triumphant testimony to human endurance, fortitude, and achievement. Our relatives from the distant past created enduring civilizations in the islands and atolls that they discovered. They were at one with the sea and the land. Fast forward again now to modern times and my evolving role. Most of you know that uh, Fiji Australia bond became strained when that man called Rumbuka started a, uh, a period of coup culture in Fiji. Uh, he was Colonel Rumbuka then, not the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister Rumbuka that you're listening to today. So be at peace. There was an inevitability in the uh, strained relationship, which I understand about the uh, reaction of Australia and others to Fiji, and particularly to Rumbuka. As the perpetrator of the first coup in 1987, I was at the forefront of trying to manage the fallout. When I called on the Governor General the uh, day before yesterday, or oh, yesterday, was it? Yes, yesterday. I said uh, to him, uh, Your Excellency, when uh, people were talking about me then, I said, well, I was trained by some of the best generals in Australia and India and New Zealand. And he said, yes, we talked about it at the time. And they all denied they taught you. <laughs> at least taught you what you did. <laughs> in 2013, I was invited to write a piece for the Journal of the Royal United Services Institute of New South Wales. One of the Institute's aims is to promote informed debate on defense and security. I made the point that other powers would re always replace those with, who no longer wish to be involved in defense cooperation with coup makers. And that's what happened after 87. When our traditional friends turned away from us, we introduced the Luke North policy. And they, we were very well received by those who were slightly north of us and west of you. It was in line with what uh, the great Sun Tzu would have said. And they have had much success in that initiative. In that 2013 article, I mentioned Fiji's long experience in international peacekeeping, citing operations in Lebanon and Sinai, Kuwait, Iraq, and uh, other areas, and closer to home, East Timor, Bougainville, and the Solomon Islands. We were very uh, pleased that when we called on the Governor General, he recognized uh, Dr. Lessi, who was uh, on his staff in Bougainville. I was personally assigned to the Solomon Islands by the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. In 1999, when I lost the Prime Ministership, he asked me to uh, go and be the, his special envoy for peace 
in the Solomon when that country was torn by internal strife. I could see from the wider perspective how the Fiji military soldiers and sailors and engineers might provide varied training and support for different kinds of peace work. And we're very grateful and thankful to the Australian government for their assistance in setting up of the Black Rock training facility in 90. I'm sure we can uh, continue to cooperate and perhaps change the input of training. So we develop it into what we have already shown. We could take on other duties such as monitoring illegal fishing, assisting with disaster relief as we have seen done, protect, protecting endangered species, enforcing biosecurity laws and cooperating with our island neighbors. In 2020, as we have heard this afternoon, we sent 54 RFMF engineers to help with your country's bushfires. Later on, we uh, also assisted with the flood, the flood areas. And uh, more recently, we assisted Vanuatu in their problems and also the post-cyclone relief work in New Zealand. In 2013, the article I was talking about with the normalization of the political situation in Fiji, I expected a quick restoration of our bilateral relationships with Australia. I also envisaged efforts for a better understanding of each other's values and expectations. Today, Australia and Fiji are very close friends again. And to use your own expressions, we are mates. I'm assuming that's still the case after the World Cup match <laughs> a month ago. And it's a, a delicate subject, but I'm, I'm glad that we, the two captains had a toss. Who wants to go home first? <laughs> and Australia won. In 2017, member countries of our regional political organization, the Pacific Islands Forum, coined the name Blue Pacific for our area of the ocean. Consistent with our origins and ancestry, it remains the center of our lives. It is our heritage. It is our hope. The Blue Pacific separates us, but keeps us together as brothers and sisters in this very large, in its very large bosom. It is ours through history, settlement, and exclusive economic zones. Like the rest of humanity, and like you here in Australia, the people of our ocean are aware that the planet might be on the edge of something terrible. There are many facets to that. The climate crisis poses a real threat to our existence. We stress often that we of the islands did not create the conditions causing the environmental di disruptions and destruction, but we are left carrying the brunt of its impacts. We watch with trepidation as Russia's war against Ukraine rages on. It is already having a punishing economic effect internationally, particularly for us in the Pacific. If that conflict somehow expands, how will we be affected? Will the nuclear option be unleashed? Only a couple of weeks ago, reputable news reported in, uh, reports indicated that Russia had developed a new nuclear-powered cruise missile. Hmm. According to the coverage, the missile could be based anywhere in Russia and still be capable of reaching targets in the United States. In the broader context, about 30 violent conflicts scar other countries, a majority of them in Africa. 
Rivalry between the two most powerful nations, the United States and China, looks to be intensifying. There are dangerous confrontations between Chinese and Filipino ships in the South, sea, South China Sea. Will that bring the U.S. into uh, an encounter with China? This is the institute that provides answers to these questions. Tension over Taiwan are escalating, and with the potential, potential for an armed face-to-face, -face, or face-off, or worse again, will the uh, adversaries likely to be those great powers drawn into it, China and America? And now the world holds its breath as the Israeli-Hamas violence continues, and the nations begin to take sides where is it all this going? We cannot say. We'll wait for the Lowy Institute to work out what you think will happen. But for us in the Blue Pacific, history may be calling. It might be our manifest duty, destiny, to carry banners for peace and speak out for harmony in our time and forever. Look at our ocean, and you see a scattering of poor, aid-dependent island states, plus our friends in the larger landmass of Papua New Guinea. On the international stage, that does not amount to much, but there is something else. Our nations, united through the Pacific Island Forum, have sovereign rights over 32 million square kilometers of blue Pacific. That is, the only slightly, that is only sli small, slightly smaller than the combined land areas of Russia, China, and the United States. Put another way, the total area of the exclusive economic zones of the islands is double the size of Russia and larger than that of North America and Europe together. So it's not a small area that we're talking about. And I believe it gives us the right to be heard and to be recognized. What if our large area of the globe at this troubled and perilous time was to be officially declared an ocean of peace or zone of peace? Remember the word Pacific itself means peaceful or peace in character and intent. I have advocated this peace vision publicly and in a number of crucial meetings, particularly with colleagues from the farm. President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken were there when I raised the issue in Washington last month at the U.S. Pacific Island Summit. Mr. Modi, Prime Minister of India, heard the same theme in my remarks at the Forum Dialogue in Papua New Guinea, and Mr. Blinken was also there at the time. I included the call for the Pacific Peace Zone in my address at the UN General Assembly in September, adding that this would be the Blue Pacific's contribution to world order and peace. We know that the United Nations Secretary General has launched a new agenda for peace. That was before the outbreak of the conflict in the Middle East. Fiji expressed its commitment to that. And so far, the response to the proposed ocean of peace or zone of peace has been very positive. I hope to introduce a formal motion for approval by the forum at its meeting in the Cook Islands next month. I'm looking forward to tomorrow to meeting with, with, with Prime Minister Albanese and uh, you know what I will be talking to him about. How will our peace zone work? The foreign leaders hopefully will discuss it at the imminent meeting. And briefly, I envisage basic foundations built on refraining from actions that may jeopardize regional order and stability and maintaining respect for each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity. 
there would be continued emphasis on the Pacific way of dialogue, diplomacy, and, con and consensus. We will continue to promote our concept of the Wu Valley cooperation and Wu Valley ways of resolving our differences. It is possible that Fiji's trained peacekeepers might be able to assist in Papua New Guinea even in managing some of our, their tribal conflicts. I asked whether it would be feasible to find common ground with Indonesia over the complex West Papua question. These are just some of the, some of the initial thoughts. Extensive discussions and negotiations will be required with many stakeholders if the project for peace is to happen. I now mention another scheme that would fit very well, fit in very well. It is inspired by the spirit of our forefathers who were great navigators. The Pacific Blue Partnership will produce new ferries and boats for regional shipping fleets. They must be economical, efficient, and suitable for the environment. Perhaps modern versions of those huge canoes of history might once again sail the Pacific Ocean. I come back to the US-China rivalry, which is very evident in the Blue Pacific, but it does not have to have that raw edge visible elsewhere. Fiji's position is very clear. We are friendly with China now and the US always and do not want to be caught in the struggle between the superpowers. This subtle thinker, Sun Tzu, would probably have agreed with China's Blue Pacific strategy. The Chinese presence is felt throughout the region. We in, the Fiji, in Fiji have had good relations with China for nearly 48 years. Its aid and programs are valuable and appreciated. I have to be confident that China will be responsive to the peace plan. I said that because last year the then ambassador to Fiji published an article in Fiji indicating he was ahead of the game. The headline of his article asserted the Pacific should be the ocean of peace. His successor, Ambassador Kian Bo, or uh, Ambassador Zhou Jian, a month ago expressed the view that our region was a promising place for peace. And I must emphasize that China is closely connected to the Pacific Island Forum as a dialogue partner. So it is a significant stakeholder. We also very much value the renewed interest in the Blue Pacific by the US. Fiji's association with America had a shaky start in the colonial era. We had a good relationship during the war. Uh, two Fiji battalions fought as part of uh, uh, General Griswold's the 14th Corps in the Pacific. But since independence, Fiji and the United States of America have maintained excellent relations. There was a feeling, though, that Washington, to a certain extent, was leaving it to Australia. Where is Australia? To represent the democracies in the Pacific. Do you carry that in your shoulders? Friends, you've been told to look after the Pacific. Don't abandon us again. However, the U.S. has always had significant diplomatic representation. We very much applaud its revived commitment to Fiji and our blue continent. The recent summit in Washington after the UNGA was a rare opportunity for Pacific leaders to exchange thoughts with the leader of the free world. President Biden was very open and friendly and asked me whether I boxed or played football. And I said, well, what's football? We play rugby at home. At home. <laughs> but he was a, it was a very good and cordial and family-like gathering. The United States wishes to strengthen ties through support for climate change, economic growth, sustainable development, development, public health, and countering illegal fishing. I should also stress that the United States is a Pacific Island Forum dialogue partner. 
the world would become leaders of the uh, U.S. and China standing side by side. And we would welcome to see our leaders, world leaders, China and, China and uh, U.S. standing side by side with the Blue Pacific leaders and their Pacific Island Forum partners to honor the zone of peace in the Pacific. Thank you for listening. Come here. Oh, that one. This one. I thought it was over. PM, thank you. Thank you very much for very interesting and substantive remarks. Um, when Anne Marie and I first spoke about Pacific lectures here in Canberra, uh, your speech was exactly the kind of thing that uh, we envisaged. Um, it had a lot of a few controversial points, um, a, a lot of serious points. You responded to um, events in the Middle East. It also had a lot of warmth and some jokes, including about rugby, which I didn't appreciate <laughs> because I told you I got in first. Um, but nevertheless, thank you. And thank you also for agreeing to take some questions from me. And then after I've, I've had a go, I'm going to give the press and um, our audience members an opportunity to ask you some questions. Let me begin where you began with Hamas's attack on Israel. Uh, you said in your speech that Fiji stands with Israel. As a former commander of UN peacekeepers in the Middle East, um, do you think Israel has any alternative but to try to dismantle Hamas now, given the, the terrorist atrocities that it's committed? And what, what are your concerns for the coming weeks and months? I believe what will happen is that, well, the intention might be to dismantle Hamas. Uh, how quickly the world reacts to the possible counter move by Israel to the, uh, the, uh, the initial attack will determine how we resolve this. Whether we will, whether we will have a period of uh, detente where they, they ease the tensions. And then I don't know whether we will go for a rapprochement, but there should be dialogue. Uh, I have personal experience uh, in relations with the leadership of the PLO at the time in, while I was in Lebanon. Uh, eight of my soldiers were captured and taken away, and we didn't know who had taken them. And I asked for the combined uh, force mobile reserve, which was turned down by Unifil headquarters. So I asked Fiji for clearance, and my commander, my commander said, yes, Steve, good luck. So I said, well, I'm on my own, so I drove down with my escort to the PLO headquarters. They had to disarm us. And then we walked in. I told the, uh, the group, I want to see Daud. Yeah. Daud? You know Daud? Yes. Daud Jarura? Yes. Daud Jarura. Where did you know him? We were together in Staff College in India last year, 1979. I said, oh, okay. So they looked him up, found him, and just before sundown, he came down. So we had to use the remaining daylight of that day to uh, try and find our, our soldiers. We found them. They were not held by PLO or PFLP or the Syrian factions. They were held by Lebanese National Movement. They were released and they were very happy. Uh, but if we have such connections at this time, who might be our conduit for spreading words of ceasefire, detente, rapprochement, they come together, or maybe somebody takes it up with the United Nations and say, okay, let's stop, let's get back to the uh, conference table and talk about it. 
because if not, then the uh, final objective of the IDF and Israel would be to dismantle the threat on their left, left uh, rib. All right, thank you. Let me, let me go to events in Fiji 36 years ago, which you mentioned. Uh, you brought it up, so I guess I'm allowed to ask a question uh, about the Rambo-like figure I think you described him as. Um, and you spoke powerfully about that period. You said you've repented, you've been reborn, you can't remove your past, but you can compensate for it. And you said that, you said of democracy that with all its faults and awkwardness, it is the best way of governance. Um, do you think that the, the events of the last 18 months have affirmed this view about the strength of democracies? And the reason I say that is that I'm struck that, uh, that the last 18 months have shown the frailties of authoritarian systems and actually the qualities and strengths and resilience of democracies. You mentioned Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That has been a disaster for Russia as well as Ukraine. It shows that authoritarian countries can make big mistakes because the leader is, the, the underlings are too afraid to brief the leader and once he's made a mistake, it's hard to course correct. Mm. And on the other side, democracies have, around the world have shown real staying power in helping to Ukraine, Ukraine to, to defend itself. So is there, amongst all this dark news, is there some, some bright spots in, at, at this time about as you say, the strength, the resilience, the quality of democracy? Uh, I believe that uh, democracy is the better of the evils, if you can call them that. Uh, I, and I, it's a very, very much lesser evil than other authoritarian uh, systems. Uh, it will work. It will work. But how many of these champions of democracy did not, did not come out of a revolution. How many of them fought against democratic systems and monarchies at the time and developed their own and evolved their own system to become great republics, democratic republics? So given time and perhaps given the support of the rest of the world, the two sides will come to that realization. That's my belief. All right, let me come closer to our part of the world. Let me ask about the ocean of peace or the zone of peace. Uh, and you've said that you intend to raise a motion regarding that, that vision for approval by the Pacific Islands Forum. And you, you gave us a sneak peek of your discussion with Prime Minister Albanese tomorrow. You said you're going to raise it with him mm -hmm. too. Tell us a little bit more about how the ocean of peace would work in the Pacific because it doesn't feel that peaceful at the moment. You have a major, you have a number of parties in the Pacific involved in major military modernization. Um, a country like Australia, for example, I guess would probably say the Australian, if the Australian foreign minister was sitting here, she might say that Australia is, is seeking to preserve the peace in the region through deterrence. For example, that AUKUS is about trying to deter um, threats to, to the peace. So tell us about how would the ocean of peace work and what are the implications for initiatives such as AUKUS? I believe, I believe we cannot uh, take a step backwards. We'll have to accept what people now have had developed and uh, whether they will be their own uh, governance concept of their ability to project their own power or uh, combine with others uh, to project power or defend against the projection of other powers. Um, I would, and we cannot change that. What we have to do is to convince those that have had those developments to uh, ensure that they do not uh, continue to champion the power they have acquired uh, or built up, and uh, the, the blocks that they may have formed to say, okay, don't try anything. And, uh, you know, we're just humans. Everybody says that, no matter how big they are, you might want to punch them on the nose. Uh, you, may, you might get a, a battering at the end of it, but uh, 
you will do something stupid before you are taught. So uh, I hope that uh, whatever we have, we will not use to try and tip the balance that we now have, the stability uh, that we now have in the Pacific. On that topic of the balance, you mentioned um, that Fiji has good relations with China. You said, I think, that the Chinese presence is felt throughout the Pacific. Um, are there any elements of China's presence in the Pacific that, that make you feel uncomfortable? Uh, I think it was last week that they sent a uh, military vessel to Fiji. Uh, and I was not there. Uh, I was there, but I didn't get the invitation in time to go on, on board. Uh, but we have had other powers sending their military vehicles into the Pacific, military vessels, uh, naval vessels. Uh, as long as they understand what our borders are open to them to do and that we do not want to attract any uh, any counter moves that will escalate the situation and make it worse and go into um, demonstrations of uh, of uh, capabilities. I am dreaming that sometime they will, we will have developed our port in Fiji and there will be side by side ships from China and, uh, and Russia sorry, and, uh, and the U.S. getting water, refuel in Fiji, but they don't need refueling, they're nuclear power. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, that's the sort of thing. As long as they don't come and fight their, their wars in my Pacific Ocean of Peace. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to go to the audience. Climate. Australia and the Pacific are pursuing a joint bid to host the Conference of the Parties. What would it mean do you think, to have the Conference of the Parties meeting in the Pacific? One of your TV stations asked me the, the question this morning. Why would the Pacific support uh, Australia, which is a, a big emitter? And I said, well, we will not be able to put our views to them if we were not there with them co-hosting that conference. So the best way to do it is to speak with them before, speak with them during, and continue with them after. And that way, you, they will, will make them see the smaller Pacific uh, citizens' uh, viewpoint. They know what's happening in uh, Kiribati. They know what's happening in Tuvalu. And we say, please, help us out on this. Only last week, uh, we're going to, we signed, or somebody signed a, a contract to export parts of Fiji to build up the uh, uh, the Kiribati uh, Islands, uh, they're going to ship landfill from Fiji to Kiribati. And uh, perhaps in our pursuit, we can speed up and make more efficient our uh, fund requests, requisition of funds and the building up of uh, the infrastructure, the, the sea walls and using uh, biological methods. Those are the things that we are looking forward to being able to speak to Australia about before and after our perceived co-hosting of the uh, uh, the next COP that will be held here. Great. All right. Who would like to ask a question of the PM? I'll call on this gentleman first. If you could just wait for a microphone, sir, if you could tell us your name and any affiliation and then just ask a brief question, please. Sir. Nak. Nimbulub Nak Talisa. My name is Chope Tarai. I'm from the Australian National University. Uh, acknowledging uh, your excellencies, uh, invited guests, and, of course, the Reform Cannibal Cover Group uh, of <laughs> ANU. Uh, so my question is regarding the ocean of peace, as you've uh, beautifully articulated. Uh, and this question is coming from a few weeks ago. I was um, sitting with an indigenous elder in, in Queensland, indigenous Australia. In? In, in Queensland, an indigenous okay. um, elder of Australia. And uh, I don't have permission to share the person's name. But in amongst the conversation was about the voice to parliament. 
and the conversation was about how for Fiji as well with your government, trying to bring back the GCC, the representation of indigenous or progressive indigenous issues. And there was an interesting interplay about indigenous identity and so on, but midway through the conversation, she struck this question to me. Um, you are the promoters of the big ocean, indigenous people of the big ocean. Why does your government support AUKUS? Why did we support it? Why does your government support AUKUS? She asked me that, and then she followed up with this sense of, what about the Fukushima? I was struck. I was embarrassed. The reason why I asked this question, sir, is your zone of peace sounds very beautiful. How does that now operate as you go forward to the forum next month, um, considering that we ourselves have been open to certain dynamics of weaponization nuclear, of nuclear weapons and dumping. Um, and, and the reason why I recall that question, as you mentioned, is because it, it struck, it stayed with me since talking to that indigenous elder. Mm. How can we reconcile that, Naka? Uh, we are, and we were not in a position to stop AUKUS. The night before they signed the, the uh, or they launched the project in, uh, in San Diego, the Prime Minister of Australia called me to tell me, we're signing this tomorrow, and I just want you to know. And I said, why me? Anyway, uh, I'm being blamed for being part of that thing. Johnson said, no, I was not part of the planning. I'm in no position to try and stop it. Uh, this is a, uh, a tripartite strategic project for the three uh, governments, the three co countries uh, concerned. And uh, all I can do is hope that this project will assist the concept of the zone of peace in the Pacific. Uh, you mentioned uh, Fukushima. We, uh, I said at the very beginning, some uh, Pacific Island Forum countries are not with me when I said, show me the science. And you as a, a university uh, student and worker and academic understand that. Show me the science. People are still talking about the science of COVID-19, whether it was right or not right to have submitted to the various vaccinations that came around and ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, debate on that. Uh, there was a, a book that uh, two friends of mine, one friend and uh, somebody I know about, uh, it was written by a, uh, a reporter, uh, Dowd. The foreword was written by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And the afterword was written by my friend, Gavin DeBecker of South South Woods in Fiji. So they, uh, these are the, those that study the science. And there's always two arguments, two sides to the debate on science. And Fukushima is the same. And we know that the discharge of uh, treated water from uh, Chinese are, are, are worse than the Fukushima discharge, but both within the, uh, the agency requirements for the discharge of waters into the Pacific. All right, thank you. I'll take a couple more questions. Could you put up your hand if you'd like to ask a question? Yes, uh, I'll go to Meg Keane and then Peter Harcher. Meg. Good evening and thank you for the if inspiring you'd... comments. I want to bring you Just to... wait for the microphone, Meg, okay. if you would. Thank you. I'm used to speaking very loudly. Uh, I'd like to bring you to Fiji's development. You talked about some of the challenges of geopolitical competition. But uh, at the Lowy Institute, we have a Pacific aid map, which uh, the, new ver the new analysis will come out next week. But aid to the region has never been greater than it is right now in terms of the quantum. And Fiji has trebled the amount of development finance going to it since before COVID. So there's a lot of assistance and um, very complex development partnerships forming in the region. I'd like you to reflect on whether those development partnerships are giving countries like Fiji what they need to prosper uh, on the quality and the local opportunities for development, for employment, for procurement as part of that development partnership. So how you're seeing that, those development partnerships. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate very much those uh, assistance and aid 
as long as there is no hook at the end of the thing, and the, uh, they, we become uh, enslaved or entrapped by our acceptance of those. Uh, unfortunately, some aid donors expect uh, us to be compliant, uh, to submit to their demands. So we have to be very, very careful. Even risk being called, uh, why should you be looking a gift horse in the mouth? Sometimes we have to do that to make sure that we're still in control uh, of our own situation. Where are we hurrying to anyway? Why are we rushing? Our own development and our own quality of, uh, of life will have to be sustainable. Sustainable for Australia may not be what we will call in, in Fiji and the islands sustainable because it could mean uh, getting ourselves more and more into a camp that we may regret getting into. All right, final question from Peter Harcher. I'll stand up so we can see each other, Prime Minister. Um, you mentioned at the very end of your speech a proposal to include China as a partner of the Pacific Islands for... They already are. They well, already are. Okay. Yeah. Um, what rights and responsibilities do you think that you, you would like to see uh, from China in a closer partnership with the Pacific Island Forum? And if I may ask you a double barrel question, since it's the last one. It's quick. It's very yeah. quick. Um, as you know, the Australian government would like to create a Pacific engagement visa what are, the, what are your views on that, and how would you like to see that structured? My best defence to that would be to uh, continue to associate with uh, friends you know, and you have worked to, together in the past and have been happy and satisfied with the cooperation. Uh, China has been a long-standing development partner, uh, but uh, we, uh, we, we have been drawn for some time towards the, the, the two poles and the polarization of uh, powers in the world. We've, born, we've been drawn either to the West uh, Pole, Western Pole, or uh, Eastern Pole, or Northern South. I don't know which way you're looking at it, because they're both, they're both North, as far as the world is concerned. Uh, but we would... The sad thing, and it was, I mentioned this this morning, why are we uh, being drawn either to the left or to the right by two powers who were friends in the Second World War? What happened? They fought on the same side at the time. Our enemy or oh, the enemy then with Germany and Japan, they're great friends now. Now we're fighting amongst ourselves as the uh, Allied bloc and the big bloc, including the little blocks, blockheads of the Pacific. We were there with them, and it hurts us when they turn upon each other, and we are drawn, and we are forced to be drawn either to this camp or that camp. So hopefully. Whatever they do will not draw us into allies of them, of theirs, and enemy to the others. That we can maintain cordial, warm relationship with both. They both remain development partners, and they can even use us, or we can use our own position as vulnerable friends of both to try and encourage them and urge them, please maintain the peace. It's a very nice note to end on. Um, PM, I'm going to ask you to, to stay seated while I ask uh, Anne-Marie O'Keefe from the FDC to deliver the vote of thanks to the PM. Anne-Marie is Chair of the Foundation, of, uh, sorry, the Foundation for Development Cooperation as well as a non-resident fellow at the Lowy Institute. 
She worked for many years with AusAid, including as Deputy Director General. She also served as a senior Australian diplomat in PNG and as ambassador to Nepal. Anne-Marie. Prime Minister, it has fallen to me to have the great honour of thanking you on behalf of all of us here. It has certainly been a great privilege to hear firsthand your thoughts and your observations. Can I say that yours has been an amazing journey and it continues, that's for sure. Amazing is another word for it. <laughs> In my personal career with uh, Australia's International Development Agency, AusAid, I came to know Fiji very well. I got to know its strengths, its wonders, its opportunities, and also its challenges. And throughout that time, you, Prime Minister, were so often a leading force in taking your country forward, as you are today, as its Prime Minister again. Tonight, as you know, I'm here as the chair of the Foundation for Development Cooperation, which in partnership with the Lowy Institute sponsors the Pacific Lecture. The foundation was founded in 1990 with a mandate underpinned by the philosophy of self-reliance and the pursuit of initiative. Prime Minister, that is a philosophy that echoes your own tremendous achievements whether as Prime Minister or as Chair of Fiji's Great Council of Chiefs or as a distinguished soldier. And very importantly, as one of the greatest statesmen of our region. You have shown tonight and also in the past that you are, frankly, a great model for improving the human condition. You have acknowledged the actions for which you now regret in the past and are turning around to make as much of a significant contribution you can with one of them being your focus on peacemaking in our region and working for the betterment not just of Fiji but also <clears throat> of the Blue Pacific. I just want to move to something else for the moment. I'm going to be the one that gets in last. <laughs> exactly one month ago, I was sitting in a cafe in Paris, watching live on a very large screen, surrounded by a lot of Parisians. We watched Fiji decisively defeat Australia. I'll mention the score, it was 22 to 15, so that's a decisive defeat. I couldn't help smiling at the time, because I knew that I was probably going to meet you in not too much longer. And I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> no doubt you were more than smiling to see that victory having represented Fiji and Rugby Union in your own younger days. <clears throat> but I'd also like to recall your words at a media conference with Foreign Minister Penny Wong in February this year, when you said, it is sport that brings our people together. But we can see from your words tonight that it is more than sport that brings us together as members of the Pacific family. And in your role as Fijian Prime Minister and Blue Pacific Statesman, we can see you are putting action to those words as you work towards creating the Pacific as a zone of peace. On that, I would ask you all to show our appreciation and thanks for the wonderful words we have heard tonight from Prime Minister Rambuka. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done, Abbas. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Okay. Anne-Marie, thank you very much. Um, PM, let me associate myself with Anne-Marie's thanks. You gave a lecture tonight that was powerful, funny, and self-deprecating. <laughs> I liked the note you ended on, friends you know. I yeah. think that describes Fiji and Australia. Um, and I think we can be united on this, that whoever is playing England in the semi-final, we're going for them. So let's go South Africa. <laughs> Let's go South Africa. <laughs> ladies, so, so thank you very much, PM. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And please join us now for drinks and canapes. Good evening. Naga.